there's a field over here that's corrosion and there's a field over there that's corrosion at these particular very low pHs, uh, very high pHs. Uh, but at high acidity, we're always going to have this big corrosion field at high acidity. Or we can cause the material to be passivated. Now this poor bay diagram is referred to a lot by the electrochemists and the people that are trying to, to handle or prevent corrosion. Well, we need to look at a lot of things now because this is, is the, the model that the electrochemist uses to think about the whole affair. Uh, to me, it's being a metallurgist and not electrochemist, it's a little bit more convenient to look at this situation a slightly different way. And I know that my friends who are electrochemists, and we have a big group in my school that are electrochemists, they don't particularly like for me to do this because they like to word it in their words. But I think my words may help you understand it a little bit better, and I'll tell you about some experiences, and I think that uh, you, you can visualize what's happening in corrosion uh, pretty well with it. Now, actually, uh, I think that there are th only three types of corrosion. In your uh, book, you're going to find out that there are going to be three types of corrosion also listed. So it isn't that I'm telling you something different than the electrochemist is telling you. I'm just going to use some different words. Actually, the electrochemist uh, would say that there are two ki basic kinds of corrosion, and they're going to be wet and dry corrosion. And if you have a metallic material in an atmosphere where we're going to have condensation of moisture or liquid surrounding it at all times, material in seawater, whatever it is. If we have the capability of having any aqueous film on the surface, then we're going to have wet corrosion. But then he says there's something that's called dry corrosion. Now, I say that there are two kinds of corrosion, and they are solution corrosion and compound formation. And I'm talking about exactly the same thing that the electrochemist does. When I say that there's a compound formation as a form of corrosion, he would be calling this dry corrosion and saying that you can get materials to corrode by compound formation if they're completely dry and generally by elevating the temperature. So, for instance, if I take a piece of iron and heat it up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit in air that's dry, there's one thing I'm going to be sure of. I'm going to form iron oxide by simple compound formation. That is certainly a chemical deterioration of the surface, right? So we've got to call it corrosion of some kind. So we can have this kind of corrosion to occur. Now, we can have corrosions that occur that are dry corrosion and still concern ourselves about the passivity of the film. That is to say, if I want to have a material which I can take to a high temperature and it doesn't oxidize or doesn't continue to form a compound as rapidly as another material, then I want a material which will form an oxide which is impervious to the air. So it's possible to be able to have materials that are more passive than other materials or because they have these passive films developed. Well, that's compound formation. But let's look at dry, cor I mean, wet corrosion and let's look at my way of describing wet corrosion, which I think is, is not too different from the uh, electrochemist's way. Uh, and we have just looked at his way with the ionization potential that we have. But think back to your chemistry course of the fact that you had something called a solubility constant. Now, the electrochemist is going to cause us an ionization potential, right? But you had the capability of, say, putting something in water a, a material, and it may be, let's say, salt. You, you put a salt in a glass of water, and it will become saturated. And if you try to put some more salt in it, at the temperature you're at, it ceases to be dissolved, and it will retain itself as just the element or the salt that you put in. So at the temperature of your iced tea, if you put too much sugar in it, it's going to sit in the bottom of the glass, right? It isn't going to dissolve. And then you say, well, I could heat it up and it'll dissolve. And if you could get it dissolved by heating it up and then lower it back in temperature very slowly, then you have a super saturated solution, right? That is, you've, you've kind of cheated a little bit. You played a trick on a solution. It's beyond the solubility that you'd expect. It's equilibrium solubility constant has been exceeded, right? Well, then, if we have a solution 
that is going to pass over a material and corrode it by dissolving the material, we can play all sorts of tricks on it. Let, let's play minerals for a moment instead of metallurgy. Let, let's look at what happens on the face of the earth. We, we have a rock on the top of the earth and it's called, let's say, limestone. We have calcium carbonate. And here comes rainwater on top of the calcium carbonate. Well, number one, if we increase the acidity of the rain, then we will have a greater solubility of the limestone in the rainwater. For instance, if you, say, put just a small amount of carbon dioxide in the water, you will change the solubility in parts per million by an order of magnitude, or sometimes two orders of magnitude, of, say, dolomitic limestone in water. So here, we need something to saturate the rainwater with carbon dioxide. And, and you know we have these little helpers out there that do this for us, and they're called aerobic bacteria, and they live in the top few inches of the soil, and they chew away at the organic material and they metabolize and generate uh, carbon dioxide, which dissolves in the water, the rainwater as it comes down. And that mixes with the limestone and dissolves the limestone, and it goes down through the earth, it percolates down through the earth, and comes out in, let's say, a cavern. And when it comes out in a cavern, it's going to be dripping from the roof of the cavern, which is going to be cold, and also probably going to have air currents passing by it. So number one, it could evaporate the water. And if it evaporates the water, then that little drop of water becomes supersaturated, right? And since it's sitting on already a piece of limestone, it begins to precipitate out, and we build a stalactite, right? Or the temperature drops in the water. And if the temperature drops in the water, the solubility is exceeded, and the same thing happens. And so we build a stalactites that grow down, and if we do get some to drip off at the bottom, then we get a stalagmite that builds up. And that's the way these beautiful caverns that we have are built, right? By this solubility differential that we have due to temperature and the, and the exceeding the solubility by supersaturating the material. Well, we have exactly the same thing. Let's suppose we, we have a loop in a, in a heat transfer pipe, uh, have a big loop now going around, and we find out that, uh, let's suppose it's stainless steel loop, and we just are going to be, say, running NAC through it, N-A-K, sodium potassium eutectic, all right, as a molten metal, good heat transfer media, and we're gonna pump this, this NAC round and round in the loop, and we're gonna have a hot side over here and a cold side over here. The solubility of stainless steel in, in sodium potassium eutectic is very, very low. And I mean very low, way out in the decimal places, even at the high temperature. But it is something, right? It, it, there is a slight solubility. And this material now is pumped around on the opposite side, where we're going to give up this energy that says it's going to be coal. And now the solubility is even less. And so the tiny little bit of nickel and chromium and iron that we would dissolve out of the stainless steel on the hot side is now deposited over on the cold side. And so as long as we pump the material around this loop, we're going to be dissolving it on one side and kicking it out on the other side. That means we're going to be digging a hole in on this side and plugging up the tube on that side, right? Now this is called what I call solution corrosion. Now, uh, back in the teens, uh, a gentleman working for Bethlehem Steel Company named Epstein did an experiment that I thought was pretty fascinating. And what he did was, uh, he was interested in this business of uh, oxidation of, of iron, and he, he took a nail, two fresh nails off of a nail mill, and he degreased them to make sure they're perfectly clean. They were nice, shiny nails. And he took little vials of water, test tubes of water, two test tubes of water. And he didn't want any air dissolved in them. Well, suppose you don't want air in your water. How do you get it out? Two ways. Either freeze the water, and it gets burped out, or boil the water, and the air comes out. So he boils the water, puts, them in the test tube, puts it in the test tube, takes his two nails, clean nails, put them in the test tube. He plugs one of them up with a stopper. And the other one he leaves open to the atmosphere. And the one that he leaves open to the atmosphere, in a very short period of time, in hours, he notices he gets a brown flock around the nail. The nail is beginning to rust. In a day, he's got a cloudy mixture in his chamber. He says, gee whiz, uh, look at this. I, I have uh, instant corrosion 
in this test tube, but the one that stoppered up, the nail is bright and shiny. So I forgot the period of time, but some months later, he looks at this stoppered up nail and it's still bright and shiny. Now what has happened? What has happened is, in the one that's unstoppered, is the iron ion is going into solution. We saw that in the slide before, right? And the oxygen that's dissolved in the material comes along and combines with the iron ion and forms iron oxide. Actually, we could get iron hydroxide just as well. That's the flock we generally get first. And it would be further oxidized, we get iron oxide. But in the other case, we don't have any oxygen available. So we reach the solubility limit of the material and it stops. Over here, we're taking the iron ion out of solution and we're getting a precipitate and the iron ions just can, can, can continue to go in solution, right? So the process just keeps on going on and rusting away. Now we unplug at the end of months the other, other nail and as soon as the air has the capability of dissolving in the water, then the oxygen goes down, reacts with the iron ion, takes it out of solution and corrosion proceeds. Knowing this, you see, now we've learned all about corrosion in some respects. We know whether it was more advantageous if you're leaving your house and you have metal radiators in the house. Do you drain all the water at the radiators or do you leave the water in the radiators? Which is the most advantageous? It makes no difference, really. What you really want to do is make sure that the air can't dissolve in the water, right? Because you're going to hit some limits. Well, that's what Epstein taught us. And, uh, and that's a kind of what I call a kind of... Uh, a corrosion, and it's not different from their uh, display that I just gave you in the slides. But there's another type of corrosion that they really leaned on, and it's called uh, galvanic corrosion. Now, actually what is happening here is that we have these materials with uh, electropotential, and we have one of them that is going to always become anodic to another one. And so, in this particular case, we have to look at something called the EMF series, <coughs> and that's displayed uh, like this uh, on this chart that I have, where we find that if we look at some uh, measurement of the potential that exists between the materials, uh, all of the metals, let's say from the top to the bottom, actually we're just going to look at the elements now, uh, in, a, in a column, not all of the elements, not all of the materials, but just some of the metallic materials. We're going to look at the electrode reaction if we want to, to find out what is going to be, what is going to uh, ionize. And we can look at the standard potential. Now what I'm really interested in is, what's the standard potential over here? I'm interested in the column on this side uh, for the given material. And what it really says is that uh, we're going to have to refer this to some standard, something that's in, in the uh, diagram that we could refer to, and we do this with hydrogen. We take hydrogen as a standard that we are going to measure the potential against. And we find, for instance, then, that this material, sodium, is going to be anodic to the hydrogen, and it's going to be anodic by uh, 2.172 volts uh, above, above this uh, reference level. And on the other hand, uh, hydrogen will really be anodic to gold because gold is down at the bottom. There's another way to just think about it as a state to chart, and I find it's easier to think about it this way myself, and that is to say that the more reactive metals are at the top of the char chart and the noble metals are at the bottom of the chart. So sodium is more reactive than is magnesium, than is beryllium, than is aluminum, than is manganese, and so on down the chart until we get all the way to the bottom and we find that, let, let's so just suppose we have something like copper and iron. Let's suppose we're going to use uh, copper.